Good afternoon. I will now call to order our May 18, 2017 regular meeting of the City of Rancho Mirage City Council, the Library Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the redeveloped successor agency. Now I have our flag salute. Mr. Hobart, would you please do us the honor? Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Christy, will you please call roll? Council Member Hobart? Here. That's a surprise to you, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Kite? Here. Council Member Smotrich? Here. Mayor Townsend? Here. Council Member Weil? Here. Okay. We will have uh, one presentation, which is an update by Burtek Recycling Coordinator Ken Stevens. Hi, Ken. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Um, anyway, this is our first, uh, Burtek's first report to council for 2017. Um, during this time, uh, we completed the following reports and submitted them to the city, the monthly, quarterly, annual, and biennial report, um, continued retention visits with commercial customers, not just to, uh, not just to say hello, but to kind of look at their, their recycling containers as well and to see how, how clean they're keeping them. Um, the waste characterizations for the spring are almost complete. We've been working on those for about two and a half weeks now and should be done the early part of next week. Um, continued recycling, uh, offering recycling presentations to HOAs. Worked with Br Britt Wilson and prior to that, Randy Viegas to bring organics diversion to Bernie's Lounge, the Cheesecake Factory, Eisenhower Medical Center, and Fisherman's Restaurant. Um, during that time, during the, the whole part of the first half of the year, worked with city staff on city recycling solutions, roadside dumping abatement, and other related projects. Uh, Commercial diversion um, stands at 94%, and um, the reason that's not any higher is because we have a few properties, as I've mentioned before, that either don't have space for a recycling <clears throat> container, or it's just not practical to, to set one there. Um, residential HOA um, multifamily complexes um, stand at 88%, and they're, the, the ones that aren't on board are pretty much not on board for that same reason. Um, current participation in the food waste recycling stands at 37 restaurants and uh, institutions. That's all I had. Any questions? None that I have. Anybody have any questions? That's it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Now moving along, we will now have non-agenda public comments. And this is the opportunity for the public to speak on issues that are not on the agenda for a maximum of three minutes per speaker. When you come up, please begin by stating your name, city, and residence. And I have a request from Mr. Jack Shrubneck from our wonderful Ranch Mirage Chamber of Commerce. Thank you very much. I'm Jack Srebnik. I live in, Ran in Palm Desert, but everything I do is in Rancho Mirage. Um, this is the two-minute update from Chamber that I, when I took over as chairman, I said we're going to be doing this at every <coughs> meeting because you, you and us work together and to make this the greatest place to live, sleep, eat, drink, and everything. And once again, we pulled it off. Uh, Last Monday, we had our annual, 12th annual Nurses Appreciation Luncheon. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the City Council and the Mayor for changing their meeting so that they could be there because you're a very big part of everything the Chamber does. Uh, it was, in 12 years, it was the first sellout we ever had. Um, we were able to honor uh, all the people in the healthcare, first responders, we decided to do that this year. And also, we gave out three scholarships to different uh, winners for the different colleges that helps them uh, pay for some of their college education. Um, 
Last night, some of you were there, we had a joint mixer, is a valley-wide joint mixer. Every year it's at the um, Air Museum, Palm Springs Air Museum. It's a really nice time. It's when all the chambers get together and nobody bickers about it, anything and nobody talks bad about it. Every, everybody's friendly there. Um, it was very good for uh, us there because uh, many, many people have come up to me there and were just talking about, wow, what Rancho Mirage Chamber is doing. And every time they say that, I always say, it's the city of Rancho Mirage, because we don't do anything without you guys. And Chelsea, who, uh, who's our marketing uh, girl, signed up three new accounts at her Old Valley Chamber mixer. So that's pretty, pretty impressive. Um, at the end of January, I think it was January, we had the, um, no, it wasn't January, it was March, we had the State of the City. Ted Wilde did his last State of the City, and out of that came a very exciting thing. The day after, Randy Biner got a phone call from Todd Blue at Desert European or vice versa, and he said, well, I, w I heard it was really, really great. Why weren't we told, and why wasn't this? And the funny thing was is that Desert European had someone on our board, so why they weren't told, I don't know. <laughs> but with Randy's urging to Sam, I went out to Desert European, sat down. In 24 hours, we had a new representative on board. The head of their marketing is on board. And I kind of said, you know, all the years I've been out here, Desert European is a very, very big uh, part of Rancho Mirage, and they never really do anything. Well, they put their money where their mouth is, and I'm going to hand these out to you. This Tuesday night, we're having a bonus mixer at the Audi dealership from 6 to 8, completely catered um, by Desert European. They're going to be unveiling two new Audis, and I really would appreciate if you have it on your calendar that you guys can come out because, again, it was working city and chamber together. It came out with something fantastic. They want to now they want to be a sponsor next year of the Nurses Association. They want to get involved in the Rammies. It is a big coup, and Randy, I thank you for the chamber and for the city for whatever you did, it worked. So um, that's, about, that's about it. Everything else is uh, status quo. We're looking to do a new um, a joint uh, mixer, not a, it's a joint uh, <coughs> seminar with Palm Desert and, Ran and Palm Springs has come to us and we had to sit down, they want to start doing things together. This is not a merger, this is just doing things together. And again, um, I did hear one cute thing that you'll like. Um, I got a phone call from somebody at the Greater Coachella Valley um, Chamber, and he said that he was very upset because one of his people were talking to me and they said I was angry that, we took, that, that they took our name I said, I don't know where that came from, because I was never taken, you never you're took our name, you're the greater one, we're the greatest. And that's how I handed the conversation. So with that, I appreciate everything you guys do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this to Christy, she can give it out to you, and I hope to see you Tuesday night. It should be a lot of fun. Thank you. Very good. It was a great event, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other people who would like to speak on non-agenda items? If not, we will move along to our... Oh, I do see somebody. You want to come forward? Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the greatest community in the world. This city is an example, not only for California, but for the entire nation. And I applaud you all, because it is your work that has transformed this city into what it is. Um, I am being discriminated in an awful manner by one of the retailers here. And I'd like to know if you can advise me as to what to do. I like to give out clothing to people who are in great need, and I buy quite a lot from one of the stores here in Rancho Mirage. And I, today, and almost every day I show up my face, I go through the same thing. 
Today I had a whole bunch of the choices that I had made. It took my time. It took selection. And I had all these selections. And then these people who do not speak <clears throat> English just grabbed them away from me and presented them to the acting manager. And the acting manager went back into a back room that they have and he went in there and he said, you didn't choose them, it was theirs and you stole them from them. And I really feel, feel bad about it because I am a doctor, I am a member of this community, I don't live in the city of Rancho Mirage as yet, but I'm working on it. And I'd like to know if this body can help me somehow because it gives a very bad impression to have the manager come and tell me in front of everybody, you did not choose those items. These two men chose them. Maybe because I'm short, maybe because I'm a woman. I don't care what it is, my dollars are still a hundred pennies. And this man has abused me in an awful manner. Uh, before that, I purchased a vacuum cleaner. It wasn't working, it messed up my entire living room. I took it back immediately. I didn't get a receipt for it, but the person who received that from me is a very decent employee and he remembers that. And the manager has ignored my repeated request to refund my $25 that I paid for it. Um, I buy these things, like I said, to hand them out, to give them out to people who are less privileged. And i like to know if this body can help me somehow. The story is on Magnesia Falls, and I don't want to divulge the name, but it's the only store right there on Magnesia Falls. Could, could you state your name again, Ms. White? Dobreb, D-O-B, R like Robert, E, V like Victory. It means good man in Russian. Uh, Dr. Robert, um, I had asked uh, the city attorney if you could call his office. Yes, sir. Uh, which is here. Uh, he has a, some staff here. Mr. Quintanilla, uh, yes. And he said that they would be glad to discuss that issue with you from a legal perspective. Yes, sir. And uh, you have the city hall telephone number? Oh. You have her card. May I? Yeah, why don't you just make it easy here? Let's do that. Don't, don't do it today. He's going to be tied up today. But, oh, yeah? Some other day. We're going to tie me up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Wonderful very much. Job. The Thank best you. CD in America. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. And thank you, Steve. Now, seeing no other people who would like to speak on non-agenda items, I will now turn it over to our city council for their board member comments. I will start with Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, Richard Kite. Uh, no comments today. Thank, Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Richard. Mr. Hobart. Even fewer words. Thank you, Mr. This is easy, boy. Then I'll go to word to this end. Ms. Iris Matrich. Yes, I do have a couple of comments. Actually, I've got more than that. I have some photos also that Jason's going to put up on the, uh, the big screen. Um, and this is um, at the um, pet adoption from the Loving All Animals organization. And this was held on Mother's Day at the Gelson's Market in Rancho Mirage. And these are some of the pets that are available. Uh, hopefully some of these that are being seen have already been adopted, but if you're interested in adopting a pet, please don't hesitate to call your shelter and see what you can line up, fill out whatever paperwork is necessary. There's a loving pet waiting for you, and if, as Dana always says, if you're not getting enough love, this is certainly a way to get it, and um, they're all looking for wonderful homes. So as you can see, they're both kitties and dogs, and I had the pleasure of uh, also holding one, and uh, unfortunately I had to give them back, but it was uh, a dream just going to meet everyone and see the volunteers and the work they are doing, and it was a pleasure uh, knowing that these are the uh, pets that are going to be adopted and, and bring some more love into people's homes. 
I think the last, aha, uh -huh. okay, I guess we know who that is. But we had, uh, un unfortunately, there was a sweet little kitty and I had to give her back, uh, but I know she's <coughs> going to a great home. So in addition to uh, the, the uh, pet adoption, I wanted to address something that is very, very important that comes up every year because all we, as we know, uh, pets can add great pleasure to any trip uh, that you might be planning. And if you want to bring uh, your cat or dog along on your travel, uh, there's a few important tips that uh, you can just make sure you know about to keep your pets safe and to keep everyone happy. Uh, number one, obviously, dial 911. If you see a pet in an empty vehicle with closed windows, uh, avoid distracting drivers by attaching the carrier or a harness to a seat belt. Uh, provide rest stops at least every two hours on your trip. Don't open your car doors unless your pet is securely leashed inside. Uh, and to avoid car sickness, feed pets at least four hours prior to travel. Uh, the automa the uh, American Automobile Association just put out a booklet on traveling with your pets. It includes friendly hotels, activities, and pet safety tips. So don't hesitate to contact your automobile club and pick up a book. And uh, if you don't uh, have a membership there, perhaps you can just stop by one of your local bookstores or go online and see what kind of safety tips are provided. Um, also keep in mind that in our desert heat, um, keeping a animal in your car for a very short length of time can really be tragic. Um, it, it happens very quickly and we don't want to see anyone lose a pet because of uh, someone who just ran into the store for two minutes and came out um, to find something that is just a horrible experience. So uh, if you see a pet alone in the car with the windows closed, please don't hesitate to call 911. Um, everyone is trying to be careful of their pets, but we never know when someone's going to walk by a car, or see an animal that might be a little bit in distress and not knowing really what to do. So don't hesitate to call 911. If, and if, if you do see a pet in distress, um, there are some things that you can do. Um, because many people have asked me about this, you know, what the law is. Uh, and there are laws that refer to pets that are in imminent danger. First of all, take a picture of the pet uh, with your phone and call 911. But if there is no way to open the door to rescue a pet, uh, you are allowed to, using minimal force, get the dog out. And if you have to break the window, you are certainly permitted to do so. So after breaking a window, if you need to, uh, stay with the car until uh, officers arrive on the scene. So it's going to be a hot summer, as it always is. We want everyone to keep their pets safe. So just keep in mind that um, if you do see a, a pet uh, in someone's car, you know what to do. And the owner will thank you, and the pet will thank you. So thank you again. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Iris. Mr. Weil. You know, I, uh, I'll reserve my comments for a little later. Thank you. Can I make a roll call? Uh, Randy. Mr. Mayor, uh, can I make an announcement, please? We have a uh, general plan update workshop number two uh, coming up at, in the community room at the Ranch Marge Public Library on May 25th from 6 to 8 p.m. If you have any questions about the general plan update and this workshop number two, please call Jeremy Gleim, Senior Planner for the City of Rancho Mirage, 760-328-2266. That's May 25th, 2017, from 6 to 8 p.m. in the community room at the Public Library. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Now we will move on to the approval of the regular meeting minutes of May 4th of 2017. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, I will call for a motion. Motion, motion to approve. approve. Is there a second? Second. Please vote. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Christy. 
Next is the consent calendar. I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Randy Binder, our illustrious city manager. Illustrious. Yes, Randy. <laughs> Mr. You, Chairman? Yes. Excuse me, I'd like to uh, correct the record. I voted yes uh, on the approval of the minutes. I should have abstained because I was at that law conference oh, in San right. Francisco at our last meeting. Uh, Thank you, duly Thank you. The noted. Record and so like that. that I don't get credit for having a memory better than I do, it was <laughs> Richard who reminded me. <laughs> Very good. Duly noted. Thank you. That's we'll nice. correct that. Richard, yes, you are Randy. illustrious. It's all yours, Randy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. Today's consent calendar is a fairly long one. You have 11 items on your consent calendar. Item number one is award of contract for the Highway 111 Street Rehabilitation Project from Bob Hope Drive to the Eastern City Limits at the uh, Parkview Channel, I think that is referred to, the Eastern City Limits with Palm Desert. Uh, this will remove and replace the entire section of Bob Hope Dr of uh, Highway 111 in both directions. Uh, there will be a uh, lane open at all times. If the council approves this, the project will start, I believe, in June and com be completed in late September. The street, I was talking with uh, Bill Ignos, the uh, city engineer, the street was last um, comprehensively um, rebuilt about 25 years ago, long time ago. So over the years, we have... Uh, um, diligently completed crack sealing and slurry sealing and top coating and we've gotten um, all of the uh, life out of the pavement that we can. Uh, this is an expensive project, $776,000 and $92,000 for support services including s surveyors, material testing, inspection and contract construction management. The total cost of the project is $868,184 and the recommendation is to award the bid to the lowest responsible and responsive bidder, All-American Asphalt. And on page 1-2 is the list of the support services that total $92,000 and the various uh, subconsultants for that. Um, staff checked on the, uh, um, rec on, the, uh, on the references that were reported and uh, everything is in order, including the contractor's active state license. Item number two on your consent calendar is an amendment to the contract with clean cut landscaping for construction services <laughs> at the Ranch Mirage Dog Park. This is City Project 14-311. Uh, there's two recommendations to approve the amendment to the contract in the amount of $452,604 and approve the fiscal year 1617 appropriation adjustment uh, request. These uh, modifications were uh, reviewed and recommended for approval by the city subcommittee during construction to improve the functionality of the dog park and be sure it's uh, operating in a first-class condition. Item number three on your consent calendar is final acceptance of the Rancho Marge Dog Park. There are three uh, recommendations listed there, and if you approve the consent calendar, they would all be included in it. Improve the, accept the public improvements as complete, authorize the notice of acceptance to be recorded, county recorder's office, and then authorize staff to execute the release of the performance bond. Item number four on consent is final acceptance of the community park shade structure and the same three recommendations, uh, actions that would be taken on this as well. These are the uh, shade structures and the fabric sales that provide shade at the existing children's playground uh, on the east side of the uh, park. Item number five would be final acceptance of the citywide crack sealing project, City Project 15-317. The project was performed uh, around uh, various high, uh, streets around high, um, city, including Highway 111, Duval Drive, Ramon Road, Morningside, Gerald Ford, Monterey, and a variety of residential streets. Uh, this project was completed 
uh, using rubberized emulsion aggregate slurry, or RIAS as we commonly refer to it, which is the standard application procedures to extend the life of these streets. The, uh, this is part one. Part two of this uh, investment in maintaining our assets will include slurry sealing in the fall. These are done in the spring and the fall because the temperature is the right uh, range uh, for uh, most effective application. Item number six on your consent calendar is final acceptance of the roof construction services at Parkview uh, Villas. Uh, the budget for this was $182,320. The project was completed under budget and on time, and this included a new roof system over the carports. Just the carports, Marcus? Just the carports, all of the carports for the 82-unit Parkview Villa project. Item number seven on your consent calendar is approval of the fiscal year 2017-2018 rent levels for the city's affordable housing projects. This is an annual review of the uh, rent levels. There are no significant changes listed. The city basically looks at the, uh, or the property management company looks at income and uh, uses a percent of that. Uh, coupled with any outside uh, federal funding, and that's what the rent is. Some are adjusted upwards a bit, and some are adjusted downwards. Uh, and this is uh, this is an annual um, requirement. Item number eight on your consent calendar is approval of the revisions to the fiscal year 2017-2018 rules and regulations for the city's various affordable housing projects. Uh, there's minor amendments to the uh, rules and regulations, including changing Time Warner to DirecTV uh, at Whispering Waters. The uh, rent increase is 0.3%. And the uh, prescription rent credit has been updated to reflect the 2017 Riverside County affordable uh, housing income limits. Item number nine on your consent calendar is a uh, levy of assessments for the landscape and lighting maintenance district number 87-01 for fiscal year 2017-2018. This is step one uh, to adopt the three resolutions on page 9-1 and then step two if this is approved today will be to hold a public hearing at your next regularly scheduled meeting on June 1st, 2017. Uh, these assessment districts, there's five separate geographical areas and the assessments for individual properties range from $78 to $421, uh, depending on the size of the district, the number of uh, square feet of maintenance involved, and the number of housing units that contribute to it. Um, it's a, not a complicated equation, but that's how it's figured every year. And uh, the one uh, at the end is the citywide landscape and lighting district that applies to all properties, and that's set at the at $26.42 per house. <clears throat> Item number 10 on your consent calendar <clears throat> is approval of the uh, contracts. It includes two contracts for a comprehensive update of the city's fees that are charged to developers uh, in order to process development applications, and this is a cost recovery uh, fee only. And then the other part of the, uh, the other study is a development fee development impact fee update uh, to update the number of projects that would be included in the development fee that developers pay to pay their fair share of impacts, incremental increase in impacts to the public services that the city provides. Uh, that will be a process that will include the uh, Building Industry Association, Desert Valley Builders Association, and will include a nexus uh, um, study that goes along with it. And uh, I would imagine that Joseph Carpenter, our senior management analyst that will head up these contracts, will in, uh, include a uh, subcommittee at every step along the way. Item number 11 on your consent calendar are demands. And Mr. Mayor, turn it back over to you. We are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Do any council members have any questions of staff at this time? Nope. Nobody. Do any members of the public wish to speak regarding any of the consent items? Seeing none, I will call for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. I have a second. Second. 
Thank you. A first and second. Please vote. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Next, now we will move to reports and information items. Item number 12 is CV Link update. Are there any updates on the CV Link? A little bit. Mr. Dana. <clears throat> Uh, first, let me welcome Ms. Felchi to our chambers. Nice to see you as usual, making sure that I stay honest. And I'll do my best. Uh, <clears throat> a meeting was held on Monday, May 15th, just a few nights ago, uh, at Palm, De Palm Desert City Hall uh, to uh, consider uh, passing or approving the uh, draft environmental impacts uh, study or report uh, for the CV link. This is one of the major procedural steps, and if that is not, uh, if that's not passed, uh, then the program goes back for modifications. Uh, this is also a, sto a story that is, illustrates a sorry misuse of public funds for political and career ambitions. The vote last Monday to approve the draft environmental impact report it cost CVAG about a million dollars or so to secure, was 11 in favor, one abstained, and one opposed. Rancho Mirage was the opposing vote, and uh, Indian Wells abstained. These are roughly the same 11 votes who voted against conducting an investigation of CVAG to see if our application for a recent $25.4 million state active transportation project grant or program grant to see whether our application was intentionally or accidentally misleading. You will recall that CVAG initially ranked number one out of some 450 applications throughout the state. Then, after the score had been announced publicly on the internet and wherever, some of the applicants who had lost, or lost uh, to some extent, uh, they closely examined the CVAG grant application. The application was signed by Executive Director Tom Kirk, and <clears throat> contained about 25 to 30 pages. The people who did the examining, those were people who had submitted applications for their own organizations, uh, having suggestions on how the health and uh, uh, activity of their communities could be enhanced. Uh, what they found uh, was virtually a bombshell. After their examination, they made their findings known to the California Transportation Commission, uh, representing the uh, state that was funding this grant application. And <clears throat> I should first tell you that the, the grant, one of the, one of the major conditions of the grant was to afford some sort of active transportation program for lower uh, to average median in income uh, areas. The more you could benefit uh, an area of, of need, a median or lower than median uh, income area, uh, the, the more points you scored. The application that we submitted, or that CVAG submitted, on our behalf, because Rancho Mirage is a member of CVAG, that application contained some errors that were discovered by those people doing the closer inspection. What they discovered was in the south end of the proposed CV link, they included census tracts, which as you know, provide basic information about smaller groups of people 
uh, two two thousand to five thousand usually, but it can be more or less. Uh, information concerning incomes, average income, that sort of thing. The communities that were listed as part of the CVAG benefit group had to be within two miles on either side of the CV link to qualify. The CVAG application had brought in census tracts from much further south, from Mecca, from Oasis. Uh, T, uh, Oasis. Thermal and Oasis. These were all communities that did not qualify within that two mile radius. So including these communities, these census tracts from those communities would have a tendency to bring down the benefit level in favor of more of what the state would like to have had. In addition to it being loaded with improper low-income census tracts, our application omitted 17 census tracts covering many of the more wealthy areas of our community, which by them not being counted, they would have brought up our average income if they had been counted, but if they're not included, we dropped down to a point where we became first in the state and we became eligible and likely winners. In fact, CVAG uh, Executive Director Tom Kirk uh, was on some occasions mentioning it as we were getting $25.4 million. <clears throat> Rancho Mirage brought a motion to the um, CVAG uh, executive board meeting in its May meeting. And the motion that we made was that we investigate to decide, we, we hire an investigator or turn it over to the district attorney, but hire or have somebody investigate to see if our mistaken information was intentional or ac accidental. We wanted to know uh, whether somebody associated with any of our groups uh, actually intended for our score to be artificially low based on false information. So when it came time for a vote on that matter that uh, as I said, Rancho Mirage, through me, I was the uh, delegate to the executive committee. Rancho Mirage uh, argued it, nobody else, nobody else said a word. As soon as I finished my comments, which took about 20 minutes, immediately, without any discussion, uh, the uh, mayor of uh, La Quinta, uh, Linda Evans made a motion uh, that was parliamentary-wise and according to our rules of procedure-wise, totally improper. Had nothing to do with the subject matter. Any of you who are parliamentarians know that a, an amendment to a motion has to relate and, and be germane to the subject matter of the main motion. Uh, her motion uh, was wildly different, had to do with other issues that had not been discussed, and by voting on that actually constituted a Brown Act violation. But at any rate, uh, nobody argued at all against the points that I had made for 20 minutes, and this substitute motion, as it was first called, then it was changed to an amended amendment, which amounted to the same language uh, in place of our motion to hire, to have CVAG hire an investigator to determine if our $19 million error was intentional or accidental. And so they held a vote on the amendment, which from a parliamentary perspective was also 
uh, as improper as the first one because it wasn't germane to the subject matter, not to mention the Brown Act violation. They voted on a matter to approve certain conduct of other organizations <clears throat> having nothing to do with this. Uh, and that violated the Brown Act because that subject hadn't been on the agenda. At any rate, the vote was 11 to 1 to 1. Same as the vote for the uh, approval of the uh, draft environmental Im uh, uh, impact report. To spend well over a million dollars for a project, to build this project, uh, and by the way, they use the figure 97 million, some hundred thousand, uh, as being the cost to build it. There's documentary evidence to show that at least four years ago, they were using the $100,000 figure as being the cost of building the CV link. And now they're still talking in terms of it being 100,000 or, or 100 million, I'm sorry. The other number should have been 100 million, as this number is 100 million to build it. 100 million dollars, and they haven't indicated an increase in cost because of, of um, inflationary factors, nor have they presented some data to say, well, that's okay because Rancho Mirage and Indian Wells are not going to be part of it, and therefore we save some money. So there is an argument to be made there, but they've never uh, mentioned the argument, much less defined it. My point was that to spend over $100 million without the express approval of Valley residents is the height of arrogance and a disregard of numerous public recreational needs throughout our valley. CV Link is not the Lone Ranger when it comes to recreational potential for the public. There are a lot of applicants in that last competition as well. The refusal to allow residents in our cities <clears throat> to vote is justified by executive board members, is justified by what they know is not truly a correct analogy, but it sounds good. Uh, as uh, one of them said a uh, couple of times, uh, well, the Jefferson uh, over, over uh, what do you, the roundabout, what do you call that, Randy? Overpass. Overpass, yes. is it an overpass? Yeah. Anyway, the yes. Jefferson overpass, uh, is an example. It, it's in Indio and it helps vehicles in Indio. We didn't uh, turn that to a public vote, the person said. And you could say that about every item that every city council has voted on. Um, but nobody has drawn an analogy of the height of this project, the, the immense breadth of it and the expense of it. Uh, that's going to be valley-wide as compared to something in one city or another city. Uh, but <clears throat> as I pointed out at, at the meeting uh, that we held the other evening, uh, the systematic false statements about <clears throat> the costs, uh, the justification for not having a public vote they haven't even had, by the way, a city council vote. None of them, except for Indian Wells and Rancho Mirage, have even allowed their city councils to vote on the issue. And uh, that remains a, a point uh, that is never discussed by uh, CVAG or its executive committee leadership. <clears throat> One of the most common of the misstatements uh, that I've heard numerous of them make, uh, Mayor Harnick, uh, Mayor Evans, Councilwoman Fote, Councilman Wilson, Wilson of Indio, Fote of Palm Springs, Evans of La Quinta, and Harnick of Palm Desert. Uh, they've all made the statement uh, that we, that if we do not spend this grant money, uh, it will be returned and lost to the valley. You know, over, over the years, you hear uh, discussion about how, you, how 
a lie, if repeated frequently enough, eventually becomes the truth in the minds of the vast majority and votes would support it, even though it's completely fabricated. Uh, the, fact, the fact of the matter is, the vast majority of the money, and I, I wonder if you've got, uh, could you put that up? These are, the, these are the CV Link funding sources that they've got up, up to date. And you can see by this breakdown that 76% uh, of the money that has been received would stay in the Coachella Valley. And many things be put to much wiser and better and more needy use. But 62 million would. Arguably, 19.2 million dollars uh, could go back to somebody else. But some of it would have to go back to Riverside County. So if we lost it, we'd lose it to Riverside County. For example, item number seven is the $5 million that they ended up getting after their, night, their what they would have received being $25.4 million until they found those errors. That reduced their score down to the point, instead of getting 25.4, they lost $19 million. And CVAG ended up getting of 5,584,000. So their so-called errors, accidental or intentional, whichever, cost them or cost uh, them the difference between uh, 5.5 million dollars and the uh, and the 25 million dollars that they would have received. Uh, but this is the fact. But even at the meeting that the uh, environment at the draft environmental impact uh, report meeting uh, the other night at Palm Desert, somebody made that same statement. Uh, somebody from the audience, I believe, one or two people from the audience spoke. Uh, there were about 50, a little over 50 people, I think, who spoke. Uh, most of them bicyclists or in the bicycling industry. Uh, they, but whoever uttered those words, they said the same thing. That, and I'm sure they could pass a lie detector test as thinking that was true. But these, these statistics that I've just shown you show that the, uh, uh, the money, 76% of it, would have stayed within our own boundaries. That is our own Coachella Valley boundaries. The $17.4 million in Sentinel power plant money. Could we have that come back up again? Thank you. Item number five is the one we're talking about here. The $17.4 million in Sentinel power plant air quality mitigation fees is this subject. These mitigation fees were meant to offset the additional air pollution created by the Sentinel power plant. To date, the $17.4 million allocated to CV Link has mitigated zero air pollution, and the Sentinel power plant has been, an has been in operation polluting our air for years now. The CV Link's own health impact assessment notes that even when completed, the CV Link will have a negligible impact on air quality. So all of that talk that we've heard over the years about how it's going to benefit air quality uh, is simply not a fact. It's, it's comments made without substantiation, and they become the truth, or stand-ins for the truth. Many air quality experts have spoken out against the use of these mitigation fees for the CV Link. CV Link should allow these funds to be repurposed for projects in the valley that will help our air quality. Think of all that money, 17 million, sitting there to be used. The money is available to us, but because it was dedicated with a lot of political influence, I might add, it was dedicated to the CV Link. We've got all these years of no, non-use while carbon dioxide continues to flow and build. And by the time, who knows whether the CV link would be finished in five years, seven years, 10 years, 
But up till then, the uh, uh, money that the Sentinel power plant w expected to be used uh, for, to reduce air pollution is sitting dormant doing absolutely nothing, all because we're waiting for the so-called CV link. The talk of bicyclists uh, coming into the uh, valley as tourism dollars, they're going to bring tourism dollars, and I suppose they would to some extent, to the extent they come in. Uh, but people bringing their bicycles in are going to be bringing them in on automobiles that are driven by regular fuel, some electric, 5% maybe, 10. Uh, the bottom line is, if it attracts bicyclists, it's attracting pollution to the valley. I've raised that subject a good number of times, and I can't remember once anybody refuting it or rebutting it. And maybe Ms. Felchie will be able to have somebody send me a note and tell me why that assumption is incorrect. Desert Regional Health District, you see here on the list, for $10 million. With recent talks expanding the Desert Regional Health District to the eastern Coachella Valley, one of the main hurdles was a lack of funding. How much good could 10 million do in the eastern Coachella Valley for health programs and grants? Probably a lot, and 10 million could be a very good start. The eastern valley needs help, and it has a fairly wealthy western valley, all part of the same community, the broad community of the Coachella Valley. Uh, they have their active transportation projects that didn't get funded because of CVAG's application. Uh, they, need, they need a lot of help. Their roads need help, as do ours. Uh, there's much we could be doing and, uh, for the Coachella Valley, for the southern portion. Uh, I just heard, and I'm not sure if it's a fact or not, but I just heard a day or two ago that Desert Regional Health District withdrew uh, one or two million dollars from any of these grants. I'm not sure if that's true, so I don't want to make that as a statement. Uh, but I did, somebody said that, so I'll consider it a rumor, an unsubstantiated rumor. The $20 million that you see here at the top, number one, CVAG transportation funds, Measure A funds. As the recent gas tax increase demonstrated, we don't have enough street and road funding to maintain our core infrastructure. Our Measure A funds should be very reserved, should be reserved for our streets and roads, bridges, and ever increasing costs of interchanges. The, the idea of using Measure A funds, which CVAG is absolutely committed to doing. They will try to deflect you and say, we've never spent a dime on measure, of Measure A funds that, we, that they claim to have allocated to them for $20 million worth. We've never spent a dime of it. That's true, uh, because they haven't got that far along in the project, in the building project. Uh, but they plan on using it not only for construction, they plan on using it for operations and maintenance, which I'll mention in a second. The people most responsible for this misuse of Major A public funds, in addition to the CVAG executive director, Tom Kirk, uh, were those who tried to influence our Rancho Mirage election, in which nearly 80% of our voters opposed this waste. Would, would you take this off the screen, please? I don't know that you'll be able to see it. But when we held our election back in, was it in April, April, April of 2016, we got these very expensive, very uh, enticing uh, 
letters, if that's what they are, uh, in, in the mail. We got, there's three sets of them that came in telling our people how to vote in our election on whether we want C.V. Ling. And as I said, the people who are in control of CV, of uh, CVAG and who support CV Link, the heaviest, are the people whose names appear here. Mayor Pro Tem Jan Harnick, Palm Desert. Mayor Linda Evans. Uh, Councilwoman Jenny Fote. Councilman Mike Wilson. These are the people who were trying to induce our people with some of the baldest, I won't go into the details, but there's one thing I want to show you. It's just bad politics, and bad statements, inaccurate statements. Uh, I won't read them because I don't want to take up too much more time. But one of them, this one, you can see over here, it looks kind of like a gas station. I have to do this backwards. Uh, this over here is the edge of our library. I don't know if there's nothing I can do to change that. Over here, oh wait, over here, the gas station, it shows two low speed electric vehicles waiting or being charged. This is just outside the door of our library. This was their plan. This is what they wanted and intended to do. This is on other documents, this drawing. This is their drawing. At any rate, <clears throat> turnabout is fair play for them to be identified if they're going to come into our community and spend I don't know how many thousands of dollars it takes to mail this to the registered voters of our city and to do it three times, uh, three times that I'm sure of, maybe more. Pretty considerable chutzpah, and it just shows, it doesn't show, it implies that there's a, there must be more than one reason that people are interested in having this CV link thing built. Uh, for transportation. I know why the bicyclists want it. Who can blame them? Uh, but they didn't support an effort to get rid of 14 feet, 14 feet of a 25 to 30 foot pathway is dedicated to electric vehicles, seven feet in each direction, mandatory minimum, uh, that has to be built to the specifications of public roads. Very expensive. Why didn't they let us just have a bike path and go to each community and see how we can let it meander through the communities uh, with, uh, without disturbing residential areas and business areas? These people who ran and run this organization uh, and have for quite a while would never tolerate uh, the public having a say in all of this. Now, one other issue that I'm going to mention it more in a moment, but passing the draft environmental impact report means that they now have an approved environmental impact report, which allows them to commence their building process and move further into the development uh, of the project itself. The fact that this was approved up to this point in time now, where there has not been given to any city a rough approximation, much less specificity, as to what it's going to cost 
each city for operations and maintenance over the expected 75 year life of the CV link. They're, they've got approval to build it, and not one person on the committee, maybe Tom Kirk probably has a good idea, but he's not sharing it. Uh, not, not a soul has any idea of what it's going to cost for operations and maintenance. This is the final master plan, third, or third version, I believe, August of September. I think it's the third version. It's identified as Conceptual Master Plan, Volume 1, January 2016. Uh, it's been approved by the Executive Committee. Not on page 15, and you could look this up, by the way, on the Internet. Go to CVAG, go to the Master Plan, CV Link Master Plan of January 2016, and you'll see at page... 15, what I have highlighted there in yellow, right up here. We've approved the project. The cities are all in, ready to roll. How much is it going to cost the cities to maintain? What do you think they tell them? What do you think they have said? They certainly haven't said how much it's going to cost the cities to maintain this, this is what they say, a funding plan for operations and maintenance is in development. Pro then they list what they say are, there, are some of the potential funding sources. Well, we don't care about potential. What's important to know is they've approved this project. These city council representatives who are on the executive committee have voted to approve this project without knowing what each of their cities is going to have to be responsible for in the way of operations and maintenance expenses for 75 years in the future. Now, there was a time back in March and April of 2015 when the then master plan, I think it's March of 2014, it could be, maybe it's 2015, uh, where that plan was stated. In fact, Tom Kirk came to Rancho Mirage on March 30th, 2015, met with four of us just outside of this room, and he told us of his plan for annual cost to the cities for operations and maintenance. It was put into writing on, in the April 6, 2015 version of the Transportation Committee, which was going to be the first committee to actually recommend approval, final approval. It was scheduled for final approval in April of 2015. This was this plan. Now, when Tom Kirk came to us on March 30th, he laid this out. And just to give you an example, this is, every city is identified on these scales. It covers a period of nine years. In year one, Rancho Mirage share of O&M would have been $22,842,000. Not, not million, 22,000. Uh, let's just round it, 22,000. That would be our share in year one. Increasing, increasing over the years, and he's showing the increased years. Now, when you get down to the bottom here, you get to the ninth year. That would be year 2025. Rancho Mirage's share was projected by him at the time of April of 2015, was projected to have increased from the 22,000 to between two figures, between 
$111,000 and $251,000. Those are the numbers. That's what would have been signed, sealed, and delivered in April. Here's the signature page. That was going to be signed. That was the deal. Well, Rancho Mirage said at that meeting, expletives omitted, uh, you're out of your mind. Nobody, Rancho Mirage is not going to uh, uh, buy into a program that would, in the ninth year, cost us that kind of money. It's just not, I mean, our budgets, that, that would be crazy. At any rate, we've come a long way, but we still don't have a figure now, because they, then they withdrew all of that and went through a lot of, a lot of uh, permutations, but uh, they've never come up with uh, a final number that any city council member can go to a city council and say, if, if you authorize me to vote yes in favor of the draft environmental impact report, you're talking about approving essentially a, uh, a cost of the city, an annual cost of the city, of X number of dollars. There's nobody in business who doesn't operate that way. You don't build something and then decide whether you can afford to maintain it. You go through all of those permutations well before. <clears throat> the last thing that I want to say is in reference to what is referred to as an implementation agreement. CVAG is a joint powers authority body. It was created by all of the cities of the Coachella Valley coming together and agreeing that we needed or we could benefit from one body that could deal with problems that were common or basic maybe to, to each other's cities, but it was to accomplish certain things. Implementation agreements come and go. Uh, now, the implementation agreement is a document. Once you have your Joint Powers Authority organization, which is CVAG, Coachella Valley Association of Governments, is a JPA. Once you have your JPA, it does whatever has been given to them by the cities, ceded, C-E-D-E-D, -E -D, to them, authority that the city has, but which it gives away. And once you've given it away, you've given it away. There's no coming back and saying, I'm gonna take it back. You can get out of the organization, but that's, even that's a lengthy process. The, uh, so the implementation agreement is required for any project that does not fall within the authority that we have previously given to CVAG. It is our position, certainly mine as a lawyer as well as mine as a representative of, of our city. Uh, I know that Steve Quintanilla's uh, Office has studied the matter, did a report. His opinion and mine are the same. Uh, there has not been an implementation agreement signed by any of the cities where they have given authority to CVAG to build this 50 mile long project that is exclusively a CVAG idea. Just because they have an idea doesn't mean they can do anything. They have to have been given the authority by the cities to do it in the implementation agreement. And if they don't have an implementation agreement, they do not have authority to build the CV link. At the meeting the other night, I asked the attorney, uh, Ms. Egebreton, they've had two attorneys, CVAG has had two attorneys on this matter. First they had, um, there it is. 
First they had um, Gus Best and Krieger. Then they, they wrote an opinion. They said there's an argument that Measure A money, it was, it was a fight over Measure A issues in that, at that time. And they say there's an argument that Measure A money can be used for CV Link. Uh, skipping that, there's not been an opinion written by any attorney that I'm aware of that says there is an implementation agreement in existence that covers CVAG's right to build the CV link. I asked the attorney who had sent out a note, an email note, a year or so ago, I think, maybe longer. And in that note, she said, I uh, have never given a written opinion regarding uh, an implementation agreement. But I have told Tom Kirk that, in my opinion, uh, the one that we have, the implementation agreement we have, is adequate for these purposes to build the CV link. She didn't identify in that note which implementation agreement she was talking about. And there are about five or six, maybe, implementation agreements that have been created since 1974 uh, having to do with CVAG business. And, but she didn't identify the one. And I had been trying for a long time to get them to tell me what, what was the implementation agreement on which you claim a right to be able to build this project uh, through the cities. And she mentioned one that had been attached to a document that we had submitted through our planning department in connection with these various issues. And I held it up. She was sitting on the dais over yonder. I held it up and I said, is this the one? And then I kind of read the top of it up there. Uh, and she said, yes. And I was sure this was the one they were referring to from other, for other reasons. I was thinking that was it. But I've never had a lawyer from, from them say that there was an implementation agreement that gave us the authority to create and build C, uh, CVE Link and to have the cities pay for it. Now, this implementation agreement under which they claim this authority doesn't give them that authority at all. I won't read much of it, but I will read the paragraph that says why we have this implementation agreement. This implementation agreement is dated in June 1989. Clearly, CV Link wasn't being contemplated by anybody in June of 1989. But they claim this is broad enough that it would cover it. Well, holding aside the argument of how much nonsense that is, I would have you only look to page three. There's a lot of, uh, where, there's no whereas on this one, but it talks about the parties to it. The parties find, uh, I mean, here's one of the findings. The parties find that existing and future sources of revenue are inadequate to fund substantial portions of the regional transportation system improvements needed to avoid unacceptable levels of congestion and related adverse impacts. Uh, well, our funds certainly were inadequate. But finally, over on page 12-4, it says purpose and powers. What, what they can do, what CVAG gets from the cities that sign. And all of these cities are on here. Coachella, Indio, La Quinta, Indian Wells, Palm Desert, Ranch Mirage, Cathedral City, Palm Springs, and Desert Hot Springs are all on here. The paragraph 1.1. Each member to this agreement has the common power to plan 
four, acquire, construct, build, da 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 da, for the purposes of planning and constructing transportation facilities. The purpose of this agreement is to jointly exercise the foregoing common powers to oversee and implement the Transportation Uniform Mitigation Fee, manage and funds generated from such fees, and any other funds designated to the planning, funding, design, and construction of regional streets and highways in the Coachella Valley. Da, da, da. Uh, TUMP, Transportation Uniform Mitigation Fees. The TUMP program is a program by which builders who develop houses and apartments and everything else, they have to assess the impact on traffic that their project is going to uh, create. And that is translated into a certain amount of money. And that money is paid by the developer. He gets it back through the sales of the houses. But that money is paid over to the developer, or the developer actually hangs on to it, until he's got it in his hands. And he immediately gives it to the city in which the project is to be built, say Rancho Mirage, and the city of Rancho Mirage immediately transfers it to CVAG. That's what that is. And that's what this document is. It's nothing more than a document implementing the TUMF program. There is no way that it encompasses authority to build a CV link. And so I end these remarks. I'm trying as much as possible to create a, a record. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I've been lengthy. But to, to cover the details of this matter is no easy, uh, easy problem to solve. I've tried to do it, but without an implementation agreement, they cannot go forward. The problem is there's 30 days from the date of the passage of the draft environmental impact report. There's 30 days to challenge it in a court of law. That issue of the implementation agreement will only exist for a month from the time of the hearing. After that, it's waived and then they go their merry way as far as building the project is concerned. Anybody who is interested in looking at moving forward with an implementation agreement can contact me. I'd be glad to send you to lawyers. Uh, the city of Rancho Mirage, however, we're no longer part of the CV link. Therefore, it doesn't really behoove us to act as the instrument to go after them in court with respect to the failure to have an implementation agreement. Uh, we're, in a sense, out of it. Not completely. There's a big problem lying ahead between us and CVAG and this project, and that has to do with Measure A funds. The use of Measure A funds, we will defend wherever we have to defend them. But if anybody is interested in proceeding under the uh, arguments provided by the absence of an implementation agreement, they can contact me and I'll be more than happy to direct them uh, to some lawyers who know what they're doing. Thank you and I apologize to all of you. Thank you, Dana. Very good. Mr. Mayor, may I make a couple of comments? comments regarding yeah, are there any further comments? <clears throat> yes, please. Uh, what Dana described and what we saw on Monday, uh, frankly, in my opinion, is politics at its worst. And it's what gives politics a bad name. <clears throat> Yesterday, many of us received an email called CVAG Bulletin, announcing the Executive Committee approval of the Environmental Impact Report. CVAG said they have participated in about 200 public events to discuss the CV link and receive public input. The reference to public input is both misleading and disingenuous. In a democracy, every individual has the right to vote. Democracy refers to a system of government in which the power is vested in the people. Democracy lets people speak their minds and shape their own and their children's future. CVAG has never once suggested to their member cities to give their residents the opportunity to vote on this $100 million roadway with an extraordinary amount of operations and maintenance expense yet to be determined and estimated to last 75 years. 
Only Rancho Mirage and Indian Wells have given their residents the right to vote, the essence of a democracy. The propaganda has started and will continue to increase in volume. Elected officials on the executive committee use a ridiculous analogy and make comparisons to the Jefferson Street interchange on Interstate 10 that was not put to a vote. One elected even named various streets and thoroughfares in his city and said they would not have been approved if their resident, residents had been given the right to vote. A ridiculous statement. Only the most naive residents would believe such a remark, and frankly, the residents of the Coachella Valley are far too smart to fall for that line of deception. The elected city council members and other representatives on the executive committee continued to hide behind the excuse they were elected to represent their constituents. If they truly want to represent their constituents, then they should allow them the right to be heard in the form of a vote. Until that occurs, you will continue to receive propaganda in the form of what is called CVAG Bulletin. I'm very proud of the City Council in Rancho Mirage that respects our residents, and we will be guided by their choice. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ted. Are there any further comments on CV Link by Council? Seeing none, now is the time for us to ask any members of the public who wish to comment on the CV Link. I do have a card from Erica Felci. Erica? Honorable Mayor, Council Members, City Staff, and Guests, my name is Erica Felchin. I'm the Governmental Projects Manager for the Coachella Valley Association of Governments. I'll be brief as Councilman Hobart has already reviewed Monday's meeting. I would note, though, and stress that the Executive Committee not only certified the EIR for CV Link, but they endorsed a route that means CV Link doesn't extend through the cities of Rancho Mirage or Indian Wells. On behalf of our Executive Director, who couldn't be here today, I'm delivering a letter he's addressed to your City Manager. For the audience's benefit, I'll also read it into the record. In the city's formal EIR comment letter, Rancho Mirage has stated that CVAG should have studied a project alternative that prohibited neighborhood electric vehicles and low-speed electric vehicles on CV Link. Councilman Dana Hobart echoed this point during Monday's meeting when he opened up his comments by talking about how the funding secured for CV Link should go to supporting, quote, just a bike path. As you know, the Coachella Valley has a special affinity for golf carts. Perhaps it's because the electric golf cart was invented in your own city for the members of Thunderbird Country Club. CV Link is specifically designed to provide for the safe use of low-speed electric vehicles, including golf carts and neighborhood electric vehicles, on a shared use path with bicycles. While golf carts are legal on streets unless specifically permitted by a jurisdiction, golf carts are absolutely permitted on CV Link. Because I believe there's been much misinformation on the subject of golf carts coming from city representatives, I want to repeat again that golf carts, including those that are not street legal, are absolutely permitted on CV Link unless some other action is taken to prohibit them. We see this as an extension of the mixed-use pathways that we already have embraced across the Coachella Valley. And by allowing low-speed electric vehicles, we are opening up CV Link to people who might not bike, walk, or jog. That being said, CVAG continues to plan connections and extensions to CV Link. It is not too late to consider connecting CV Link to the existing Butler Avons Trail Rancho Mirage. For the third time, we are extending an offer to develop an option through the city of Rancho Mirage that prohibits low speed electric vehicles, such as golf carts, on all or part of the city's route. You may recall that CVAG staff proposed such an alternative at the June 1st, 2015 Executive Committee meeting, but the proposal was opposed by then Mayor Hobart. We reiterated this offer in October 2015, to which you responded that, quote, we do not consider this to be a viable alternative, and the letter is attached. The comments made at the, in the EIR letter and by the councilman suggest that your city may now concur with CVAG staff's longstanding position that this alternative is indeed a viable option in Rancho Mirage. 
It is consistent with the City Council's prior votes related to CV Link. Should this offer be supported by your council, CVAG staff will provide its full support to consider it as we move forward with potential additional CV Link connections. Thank you for your time. CVAG looks forward to your prompt response on this matter. And I left that with the clerk. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Are there any other comments that anyone would like to make in the public on the CV Link? Seeing none, we will close that portion. Now we will move to public hearings. Mr. Randy Miner, please tell us about item number 13. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Josh Altop, Associate Planner, will discuss this major modification, MOD 16025, for the Thunderbird Resort and Spa. Mr. Altop. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Binder. Good afternoon, council members. Before you is an application for major modification to the Thunderbird Resort and Spa for a three-level parking structure and a request for time extension on the project's parcel map. Uh, the proposed project site is located on the west side of Highway 111 at the signalized intersection of Highway 111 and Atrium Way. The red outline represents the 23-acre project site and the blue rectangle, the location of the proposed parking structure. Uh, the current request is to consolidate the two surface parking lots, as originally approved, seen in the exhibit on the left, into one centralized parking structure, as shown on the right. Uh, the new structure will occupy half the area as the previous layout. By providing a parking structure instead of surface parking, the amount of landscaping will be increased, new water features are provided, and enhanced open space has also been included. The dimensions of the structure are 337 feet by 120 feet for a total surface area of just less than one acre. Entry to the structure is provided in two locations. The first is from the main entry road at the southeast corner of the structure, and the other is an access point through the surface parking field to the west. Pedestrian access to the upper and lower levels of the parking structure is accommodated by stairwells and elevators located at the southwest and southeast corners of the structure. Staff analyze the parking requirements per the zoning code and the project requires 386 parking spaces. The project provides a total of 389 spaces or three in excess of the number of required spaces. Uh, the structure consists of three levels with the first level being subterranean 11 feet 6 inches below grade. The second level of parking will be at grade and the third level is 11 foot 6 inches in height. In order to screen the vehicles on this level, a three and a half foot decorative screen wall is provided. Architectural carport structures with solar panel capability are proposed on the third level, bringing the maximum height of the structure to 19 feet, six inches above grade. As proposed, the structure complies with all the development standards of the Highway 111 West Pacific Plan Land Use District Number 7. As viewed from Highway 111, the parking structure will be screened by a series of decorative core-tent steel screen walls and landscaped berming. The other three garage elevations will complement the architectural theme of the resort. A light and air wall is to be located along the south and west facade to provide fresh air and light into the subterranean garage level. The architects provided multiple photo simulations reflecting the design and landscape mitigations implemented to negate any visual impact of the parking structure. The design guidelines of the Highway 111 West Pacific Plan require unique landscape design elements for the parkway, which include 25-foot high date palms. As an under canopy to the date palms, 48-inch box desert museum Palo Verdes are strategically placed along the parkway. Uh, the berm will provide a noise barrier and enhance privacy to the resort and the parking structure. The structure will be adequately screened by the berm in conjunction with the use of the Corten steel screen walls and will become virtually invisible from Highway 111. As part of this request, there is an application for a tentative map uh, extension. The tentative parcel map proposed to subdivide the 23-acre property into two parcels. Uh, parcel one was for the residential component of the project, which totaled 9.8 acres. And parcel number two is the balance of the project, accommodates the resort and spa, which totaled 13.9 acres. During the planning commission meeting, the applicant requested a two-year approval for the major modification and tentative parcel map. The reasoning for the additional year relates to the complexity of the project and that it would be unrealistic and unobtainable for the project to pull permits within the next year. The commission requested that the applicant provide milestones to be met within the two-year time period. 
These milestones were identified by the applicant, reviewed by staff, and include such steps as final design layout with the water district, finalized construction drawings, and the processing of those construction plans through the plan check process. After the commission discussed the merits of the two-year approval and the inclusion of milestones, the recommendation to council was for a two-year approval on each application. If the council chooses to provide the project with a two-year approval, the modified conditions have been included in the staff report. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to address any questions the council may have. Thank you, Josh. Do any council members have questions of staff at this time? Seeing none, I will now open it to any members of the public who wish to speak regarding this item. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Do any council members have comments? Mr. Mayor? Yes. Just have a brief comment. Uh, Dana and I were on the subcommittee that began in 2015 and has nurtured this project ahead over the last couple of years. I think the change here to the, the uh, three-level structure is really uh, very important to the project. It uh, gives them additional space. I think the, the parking structure fits in well with the proposed uh, building. And uh, I think when you look at the various shots we have from the highway, it shows how well this uh, structure has been uh, covered by the necessary landscaping. So I think they've done a great job in putting together this, uh, this particular uh, addition to the project, and I would certainly be in favor of supporting it. One thing I'm not sure about is the two-year extension. Uh, normally we have a one-year extension and Josh you said in the discussion that uh, they felt that because of the some of the things that they had to do over the next year they couldn't reach that timeline of a year can you just explain that a little bit better yeah uh, the applicants here in the front if I can't quite elaborate but um, due to the size of the project uh, there's so many details for example they're currently working with the water district uh, there are storm drains that run throughout the site easements for each of these storm drains. And as they try to develop the site, they have to work with the water district where those easements go, where the future roads go. Um, those types of situations take several months of back and forth negotiations and redesigns, and that's one aspect. Um, once you get all those things worked out, you go to their construction team, their architectural firm, Gensler. They take several months to prepare the plans, um, and there's multiple levels because of the design. Uh, according to the applicant, it'll take approximately eight months to a year just for the plans to be drawn. Once they're drawn, then they would be submitted to our plan check process, which takes another several months. So the way the code works is they have to pull permits within that one-year timeline. So if we're looking at one year from now for them to actually pull permits and make it through all those steps, they didn't feel it was feasible. And uh, being uh, proactive, requested that they could have two years uh, to get all these things done to keep the project viable and moving forward. If uh, they do not complete the necessary steps during the first two years, uh, do we have the ability to give them another extension, or what's the status at that point? Um, this project's affiliated with a map. Maps are allowed to have an original two year. This would give it another two years, and then at that point we could ask for one, one more year extension, because a map can have a total of five years. So if after two years they by chance aren't done, they could request, subject to council approval, one more year worth of extension. Okay. This could be a very important project for the city of Rancho Mirage, so I, I think we certainly want to work with the developer and, and meet his time needs and, and uh, his various uh, additional things needed in the project. So I uh, totally support the project. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Josh. Do I hear a motion? I would uh, move. I would move uh, that we approve the filing of an addendum of environmental impact pursuant to CEQA section 15162 and approve major modification case number MOD 16025 based upon the content, findings, and conditions in the staff report and approve parcel map number 36885, time extension case number TPMX 36885 based upon the content, findings, and conditions in the staff report. Second. I'll second that. Thank you. Everybody vote, please. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Christy. We will now move on to the action calendar. 
Item number 14, resolution establishing a public safety reserve will be presented by our Administrative Service Director, Isaiah Hagerman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. The item before you today is the proposal to establish a general fund reserve for public safety. Uh, annually, the Budget Subcommittee, which consists of Mayor Pro Tem Kite and Councilman Hobart, and staff perform, perform a review of the general fund reserves in accordance with the city's fund balance policy. Uh, this year, the budget subcommittee uh, reviewed our reserves in conjunction with our draft two-year budget. <clears throat> The uh, topic of conversation over the last uh, couple city budget cycles has been uh, the escalating costs of public safety and the impacts on city budgets. Uh, the city is now uh, estimating annually a $1 million increase in public safety costs each year just to maintain the levels of service of previous years. Uh, this issue is not unique to Rancho Mirage, and it is one faced by numerous local uh, governments. The city places a high priority on pro providing the absolute best in public safety, and also prides itself on providing state-of-the-art equipment, highly trained and qualified safety personnel to service our community. The purpose of this public safety reserve would be to allow the city council to maintain responsiveness to changing or unforeseen public safety needs in the future. Uh, on page 14-2, uh, we summarize where our reserves are currently and uh, what the proposal is now. Jason, if we could bring up that uh, file, please. Uh, so this table summarizes our current reserves. I will quickly summarize those and the definitions of each reserve uh, start on page 14-2 of the staff report. Uh, first item is a prudent reserve. Uh, the, this current amount is 25 million. And uh, this reserve is uh, because the city's revenue streams are highly reliant on tourism uh, with sales tax and TOT. Uh, during recessions, uh, those revenue streams are highly impacted. Uh, so given the nature of how our services are funded, this reserve is meant to act as uh, a fill gap during those recessions. We have an $11 million disaster recovery reserve. Uh, as everyone knows, the Coachella Valley is right in earthquake territory. And so in the event of a major earthquake, the city would be able to utilize this reserve uh, to help city services get reestablished re or fix roads or bridges damaged during a major event. Uh, the third item is uh, a reserve for capital projects. Uh, again, uh, this reserve started originally at 10 million. Uh, so as you can see on the screen, the current amount is 6.2 million. So the city has used about 3.8 million in this reserve. Obviously with the loss of redevelopment agencies and the reduction of the availability of state grants, uh, this is how the city has managed that process and still uh, doing improvements to our community. Uh, the next one is an economic development reserve. Uh, that reserve is currently about 1.2 million. And again, uh, the previous RDA used to do a lot of the economic development activities for the city. Uh, now that we no longer have that funding stream, that's uh, what we set aside this money for. Uh, the next reserve is the Section 19 Water Reserve. Uh, it's uh, 5,125,000. And uh, this reserve is uh, in connection with the agreement that we have with the Water District to bring uh, the much needed water infrastructure for the service of Section uh, 19 in the north part of our city. Uh, there is a very unique circumstance that uh, would make it impossible for development to happen in this section of the city uh, because the cost to bring water to this section would prohibit any developer from coming in and paying that. Uh, so we partnered with the Water District on this and uh, this money will eventually be recouped by the city as development happens in the impacted zones and sections of our city. So this money will come back to the city. Uh, we also established a uh, Rancho Mirage Public Library Reserve. Uh, that balance is currently just under 3.8 million. As we all know, the uh, public library is the pride and joy of our center, uh, of our city, and really considered our community center. Uh, does a lot of great things for uh, not just Rancho Mirage, but the entire Coachella Valley. And this reserve is meant to uh, make sure that they always have the adequate funding for any needs our public library may have. And then the last two categories are where the proposed changes would take place. Uh, so the unassigned is really just that. Uh, it's a group of reserves that we, or the city council, has not designated for a specific purpose. 
Uh, and then the last item there, uh, the two items highlighted in yellow, you can see where potentially this public safety reserve would be established at five million. So the proposal here is to uh, use some of those unassigned resources to create this public safety reserve. So on the far right column, you can see the unassigned reserve would uh, drop by five million and the public safety reserve would be increased by five million. Uh, again, this doesn't impact the total amount of reserves, so you can see the totals on the bottom don't change it's just the buckets that they're flowing into thank you Jason and uh, really this proposal stem from uh, you know the the current significance of some of the costs that we're experiencing from public safety and this is viewed as another way to allow the city to remain responsive and make sure that public safety service in the city of Rancho Mirage is never compromised due to cost and much as we just saw with the other reserves you know, this, this money has a purpose that the city has, and this policy is really the city's uh, vision of how we're setting aside our resources. Uh, again, this is completely subject to council action. So if in the future we need to amend this policy, and we have amended it based off the subcommittee's recommendation in the past, uh, we are still flexible with it. But being that public safety is such a significant part of both the budget as a dollar percentage and to the community because of the value of its service, uh, we, we by far have great first responders. And this reserve just allows the uh, city council to maintain that flexibility and never compromise service to the community. So I'd like to uh, thank the budget subcommittee for for all their work and effort into this, and I think that they came up with a, a great idea here that fits in well with our reserve policy, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Isaiah. Are there any questions from council? I have just one uh, comment, um, it's sort of as a question, if I could, to Isaiah. Um, Isaiah, uh, I think I'm correct in saying that this increase is not in any way related to uh, an increase of the population of Rancho Mirage. It's not, Rancho Mirage, I think, expanded by a couple of hundred people over the past year. Uh, and I would say this increase isn't caused by that 200 additional population. You are correct. Uh, and the um, other thing I would just note, uh, only a year or so ago, Palm Desert had a, uh, uh, had a vote uh, to increase their transient occupancy tax by one point, I think, one percent. And um, it, it's timely in one sense because they're faced with the same issues as we are, but it's going to eat up entirely that uh, tax increase that they, they just enacted for other reasons. That's and uh, La Quinta increased their sales tax. I'm sorry? And La Quinta increased their sales tax by one percent. Right. for the same reason. Right. And we've, uh, I got to say, largely to the guidance of, uh, through the guidance of Randy and Isaiah, uh, you, you are generous to the committee, but uh, you are the brains behind uh, the ways we can move to solve one problem without <clears throat> creating uh, another problem. And you guys, uh, uh, we're very much in debt uh, to both of you. Very good. Mr. Mayor, if I could just add one yes. comment on to Dana's comments. The major change in the reserve fund this year was the addition of the public safety reserve. And I think as we've gone through the budgeting process and look at the needs in the future, this particular fund is going to be very important to have, for us to have. And it could certainly next year or the year after change uh, with adding more funds to it. So as we can move funds around from one reserve area to another, it's really important for us to have that flexibility and look forward to the future. So there's no reason that this fund or the reserves itself cannot increase from year to year too. Very good, thank you. Any members of the uh, public wish to speak on this item? Seeing none, are there any more comments from council on this item? Seeing none, I will call for a motion, please. I move that the uh, City Council approve and adopt resolution number 2017, next in order, approving the commitment to certain reserves for specified purposes consistent with a fund balance policy. Is there a second? Second. Please vote. 
Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Christy. Next is item number 15. Mr. Hagerman again, please tell us what this item is all about. Thank Sir. you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members of the City Council, your budget subcommittee has been very busy. Uh, each year, uh, the budget subcommittee uh, reviews the liabilities associated with uh, employees. So that includes the pensions and uh, what we refer to as other post-employment benefits, or OPED. Uh, so in the review uh, this year, uh, the OPEB plan was identified as uh, an area of emphasis that we wanted to focus on, and uh, essentially the plan is currently 80% funded. Um, so uh, the proposal being brought forward today is to uh, make a lump sum payment of $598,000 to this trust fund uh, to set aside money for these future benefits that uh, have been promised. Uh, and in doing so, that would bring our plan's funded status up to 100%. So just like we did with pensions three years ago, uh, you know, recognizing the liability Recognizing the circumstance, uh, again, we decided to fully fund the pensions. This is in lockstep with that. Uh, so this move would fully fund our uh, OPEB trust account that is maintained by CalPERS. And an important thing to note about this OPEB plan is in addition to recognizing uh, you know, the need to fully fund this, there's also key steps that the uh, City Council has taken to limit our future liability under this plan. Uh, so in, just real quickly, um, those steps included uh, the elimination of new hires uh, being eligible for this plan. So any employee hired after January 1st, 2016 does not qualify for this plan. So in essence, that action right there uh, eliminated the, the plan. You know, it'll take years to get there, but no new employees are flowing into this plan, so eventually this plan will go away. So we're not continuing to increase the liability as we bring on new employees. We have closed this plan off. The next key steps uh, were key in multiple areas, uh, not only just for pensions, but also for this plan. Uh, the city brought in a, a tier two retirement formula at 2% at 60. And so what that did is uh, it requires employees to work an additional five years before that they can retire. Well, under this plan, we only cover employees up to age 65. So under the old retirement formula, when they could retire at 55, there was a potential for 10 years of coverage. Now, under the new tier, the fact that they have to work till 60, uh, they're only eligible for five years. So again, another step to limit the liability to the city, and that also had big impacts, uh, savings to the city in the pension plan as well. So it benefited both plans here in reducing that liability. Uh, the other thing that the city did is required uh, service periods and limits. So, uh, you know, you have to work certain periods of time to even be eligible for this plan. So those were all key things that the city council has done to recognize the issues and address them and uh, prevent future liabilities from popping back up. S this action today just simply fully funds the plan of where we're at today. Uh, this is something that the budget subcommittee will continue to review annually um, because with pensions and this plan as well, the OPEP plan, uh, you know, we're, we're subject to uh, uh, future actual results. So this is all estimates now. We're projecting 30 years out. We're projecting, uh, you know, what's going to be the cost of health insurance when these current employees retire? How long are they going to be covered? So there's a lot of estimates that flow into these numbers. So this isn't just something that we do and put on the shelf. This is something that the budget subcommittee is uh, actively monitoring every year. And as we get uh, more experience and actual data to use, uh, every year we'll update this and bring any uh, future actions back to the council for consideration. So the, uh, the fiscal impact of this, uh, we have three city funds uh, that pay for our employees here at the city. And on page 15-2 of the staff report, uh, we note how this $598,000 payment is going to be split. So the general fund, of course, pays for the bulk of our employees, so they are getting the lion's share of this. Uh, the library fund obviously carries some employees, so they're going to be contributing to this. And then our housing authority has a very small amount, uh, so their payment is very small. So in total, uh, the three funds will contribute the amounts necessary based off a percentage of payroll to fund this $598,000 payment. Again, I would uh, like to thank the budget 
subcommittee. Uh, these are very uh, long and uh, detailed uh, meetings where we're pulling out actuarial reports and we're looking at assumptions. So thank you guys uh, for everything that uh, you do and the guidance you provide. It makes staff's job very easy. I appreciate it. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Isaiah. Any questions from council? Seeing none, anybody in the public wish to speak on the subject? Seeing none, do any council members have any further comments? All right, then I will call for a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, authorize, <coughs> excuse me, the city manager to execute a lump sum payment of 598000 to the city's OPEB trust fund and approve the related fiscal year 2016-17 budget adjustment. Second. Please vote. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Christy. Now we'll move on to item number 16, which is the annual appointments to the city boards and commissions will be presented by our acting city clerk, Christy Ramos. Christy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and city council. The city of Rancho Mirage holds an annual recruitment for volunteers to serve on its 12 city boards and commissions. Beginning in April 2017, the city clerk's office posted a notice inviting applications. Announcements were posted at City Hall, on the city's website, and at our public library. I also published the notice several times in the Desert Sun. All applications I received were promptly provided to the city council for review, and they are on file in my office. Nominations shall be confirmed by a majority vote of the City Council, and all appointments confirmed today are for a one-year term. <coughs> the term begins on June 1, 2017. I will read your nominations for all 12 boards and commissions, and Council may make one motion to confirm the entire slate of appointments. Any nomination requiring further consideration may be pulled from the slate for separate action. Now I will read the slate of nominations. First is the Architectural Review Board. Nominations include Dennis Freeman, Kevin Grochow, David Prest, Tim Holt, Bill Johnson, Ray Lopez, Charlie Martin, and Paul Sturwald. Next is the Community Cultural Commission. Nominees for this commission are Meredith Jordan, Joyce Virtue, Sally Trademan, Julie Childers, Frank Farino, Mayor Pro Tem Richard Kite, and Council Member Iris Smotrich. Now I'll read nominees for our largest commission, Emergency Preparedness. Nominations include Christian Lee Braun, Larry Fredericks, Mary Levine, Marcia Stein, Mark Hendler, Maria Sambito, David Richardson, Del Smith, Mary Lou Souter, Robert Brown, Dr. Dennis Maletti, and Dr. David Tang. The Community Parks and Trails Commission is next, and the nominees are Paul Hagel, Dennis Constant, Barry Lynn Freebie, Eric Wright, and Fred Struk. Next is the Historic Preservation Commission. Nominees are Carol Leibowitz, Ray Keller, and Mark Bankson. Now we will move on to the Housing Commission. Nominees include Columba Quintero, Al Fink, Daryl Mulvihill, Mary Bundy, and Velma Coombs. For the Library Advisory Commission, nominees are Stephen Locks, Deanne Nichols, Kirk Pickerel, <coughs> and Dr. Carl Brown. Next is the Library Foundation Board. Nominations are Jamie Kabler, Lucy Tagmeyer, Peter Samuels, Diane Rubin, Patrice Merritt, Diane Sagan, Joe Manhart, Lynn Walker, Claudette Pays, Charlie Rich, and Mayor Charles Townsend. <clears throat> the Mobile Home Fair Practices Commission nominees are Tom Weil, Jason Agostini, David Gray, and Jerry Burquist. Next is the Planning Commission. Your nominations include Mike Adams, Suzanne Matthews, Bill Maxwell, Larry Nichols, and Sherry Stewart. Nominations for the Speaker Series Commission are Charlie Barrett, Paula Fredericks, Ron Shero, Nick Procaccino, Jean Penn, Councilmember Dana Hobart, and Councilmember Iris Smotrich. 
The finalist is for the Traffic Safety Commission, and the nominations include Brenda Weinstock, Clayton Mays, Steve Shuey, Don Smith, Scott Ventura, Don Calkins, and Bob Schwartz. That completes the list of nominations. I want to thank Council for their assistance and support as I went through this process for the very first time. I really appreciate it. And now I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Christy. You did a wonderful job. Very, very good. That was a lot of hard work, too. Are there any questions of Council? Mayor, I'd just like to make one comment. Yes, sir. That uh, looking at the applicants this year, I think it's the best we have ever done. We really have a strong commitment from a lot of the people who have volunteered for these commissions. And uh, you can just tell by looking at the, uh, the number of commissions that are filled already that um, they've done a great job in, in selecting those individuals. So uh, we want to thank everybody that's applied. And you know, in the past, sometimes individuals said, well, I applied, but you know, nobody was chosen from that list. This year, I really think we have a lot of new people on uh, that have applied, gone through the interviewing process, and have come out a, a commission member. So it's really a great year for the commissions, I think, which makes it a great year for Ranch Mirage. Thank you, Richard. Very good points. I do not have any speaker cards from the public, so as mayor, I would like to take this opportunity to make a motion to waive any applicable term limits and confirm board and commission appointments as presented by the acting city clerk. May I have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Would you please vote? Mr. Mayor, motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Christy. We will now recess into closed session. Mr. Quintanilla, will you please introduce the closed session items? Yes, I will, but before I do that, I'd like to just uh, let everybody know that I had attended the annual League of California Cities City Attorneys Conference with Council Member Dana Hobart. And it was a two and a half day conference, and we uh, there were lots of workshops and breakout sessions, and they focused primarily on updates to CEQA, new legislation, new case law, personnel laws, proposed legislation, First Amendment issues, land use and planning issues, the Brown Act and Public Records Act. So basically they just bring us up to date on all the new laws and all the changes in the laws that are brought about by case law or the Attorney General. So with that said, at this point we're going to recess into closed session. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D, to consider the following three potential initiation of litigation items, the existing case known as Veronica Juarez versus City of Rancho Mirage. We also are going to um, discuss an existing case. The case name is unspecified in the agenda. Um, because disclosure would jeopardize existing settlement negotiations. Mm -hmm. And finally, we're going to um, recess into closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54957B1 to re uh, discuss the public employee appointment and public employment of the city clerk. Thank you, Steve. We are now in closed session. Thank you, everyone.